here. Good afternoon, and welcome to the Sustainable Materials Management Webinar Series, a joint effort between the National Recycling Coalition and the Pennsylvania Recycling Market Center. My name is Wayne Bowen. I'm the program manager for the Recycling Market Center and will serve as your moderator today. We'd like to extend a special thanks to Bob Hollis of the Mobius Network for providing the management software for this series and Lisa Ruggiero and Savannah Batowski of the National Recycling Coalition for assisting the RMC with webinar promotion and technical support. Today's webinar will discuss the keys to successful plastic recycling. Our presenter today is Tanya Randall, who I'll introduce in a moment. Following her presentation, we will conduct a question and answer session. If you have a question or comment, please use the GoToWebinar dialog box located in the control panel on your screen. You may also use the dialog box to request assistance if you're experiencing technical difficulties during the webinar. Please note that an edited version of this webinar will be made available for viewing via YouTube links on the National Recycling Coalition and Pennsylvania Recycling Market Center websites. And now I'd like to introduce our presenter. Tanya Randall has worked with More Recycling, formerly More Recycling Associates, since 2011. She currently serves as project manager for the RAP Recycling Action Program a public-private partnership to increase plastic bags and film recycling in the U.S. and oversees the outreach for the Plastics Recycling Terminology Project, which was created to improve plastics outreach, data collection, and communication beyond plastics, buyers, and sellers. Tanya received a B.S. in Environmental Science and Policy from Duke University and serves on the Board of Directors for the Carolinas Recycling Association, and she currently lives in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, with her family and pets. So I'm now going to turn the presentation over to Tanya. Thanks, Wayne. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. So like Wayne said, I'm going to be talking about plastics today. And this is going to be um, a general overview of the marketplace for plastics as we see them currently. And also, you know, the idea of how you collect material for value, because not all plastics are created equal. So to get started, um, just to give a little bit of in, uh, information about who we are, More Recycling is formerly um, More Recycling Associates. So for anyone ha who happens to know Patty Moore, uh, she has gone into semi-retirement and has handed over the reins to the company to uh, former employees who we've moved on and now we are now More Recycling. And so we have um, nearly 20 years of research and consulting experience in recycling post-consumer materials specifically plastics. Um, we work to offer deep understanding of complex and the ever-changing life cycle of plastic packaging, so pouches and films and rigid. And also we work as a liaison between industry, public agencies, NGOs, and we try to prioritize accurate information and neutrality in the marketplace. So we work a lot on surveys and data collection, and we write reports on recycling for bottles and film so that we try to provide the best information possible to the industry. So what am I going to be talking about today? Um, you know, the introduction in the value chain, like how does plastic recycling actually work? What are the different pieces? What are the components? And then moving into why quality pays. What are the market drivers? What are the influences? Talk a little bit about specific commodities, PET versus HDPE, some opportunities in polystyrene. How do you deal with film? Uh, and then how to collect for quality. You know, now that you know that quality matters, you know, how do you, how do you manage that? So clear terminology when you're talking about the materials that you're collecting if you're a recycling coordinator, and also what are the materials that you're selling if you're at a MRF or a hauler, and, you know, what do you really have in your bales, but also dealing with plastic film as it relates to keeping it out of the curbside stream and um, resources available to help with all of those pieces. So to move on. One of the key pieces is recycling as a business. Uh, it's not like unlike any other business where you have to attract investment. You need money to move forward. And so having available uh, raw material means, you know, having what you need to be able to make the products that you want, whether that's if you're a MRF, you're getting the commodities that you want to be able to bail and sell. If you're a reclaimer, having the commodities coming in that you can make a pellet that you can sell. And if you're a manufacturer, you know, making the material that you have that is a, a commodity that the general public wants to purchase. So collection quality is the key piece of that. You know, what starts in the bin and that's collection source is the key piece. So education and quality assurance is the key piece of that. But then innovate, you know, as packaging changes, as materials change, um, you have to innovate to be able to capture that. The idea that we're, you know, moving towards capturing 
pouches um, as, as something that can be recycled in the future. That's a piece that we're working on right now. And the difference between where we were 20 years ago when soda bottles and milk jugs were about all that we could manage, but now we're talking about containers and lids and caps and um, tubs. And so you need to also build adequate reclamation capacity for that material. So as you innovate, then also having the capacity to deal with that material. But lastly, you know, making profitable products. Um, you having something that comes in that you can then uh, change or modify or reclaim or process, and then you have the su sufficient in markets to to sell that material. And that's a key piece that you know moving forward in the future and, and even in the present, the idea of it's great that we're recycling plastics and that we have markets for these sorts of things, but to be able to improve capacity for reclamation and to improve demand, we also have to act as consumers. And so every time you're at the grocery store or you're making a purchase, consider, you know, is this bottle made from post-consumer content? Am I buying a fleece jacket that was made from a recycled bottle? You know, and so we also drive the pieces of the puzzle in our profession and in our jobs as recyclers, but also we need to act as consumers to demand uh, in market use of, of post-consumer resin and post-commercial and post-industrial resins as well. So some of the considerations around plastic, you know, what do you have knowing your material? Not all plastics are created equal. Obviously, um, a milk jug and a soda bottle that are all HDPE or all PET easy to recycle, easy to identify, but then you're looking into things like thermoforms or multi-laminate or um, metallicized materials. Those are much harder to deal with because they have different pieces and different components that don't necessarily come apart really well. So that leads us to point number two, what's readily recyclable versus not? You know, and sometimes capturing the material that's readily recyclable and, and diverting the other material to waste energy or to other sources or other in processes makes more sense than trying to collect everything, processing it, and then sending a lot of stuff to residual. You know, what are the contaminants? You know, what are the streams that you're collecting and what are the contaminants that are coming out of that? If you are, for example, collecting mixed retail film bags from a grocery store, your contaminants are gonna be much different than if you're collecting bottles at a deposit center. And so the idea of pulling out those paper receipts versus making sure that you're not getting glass uh, mixed in with your bottles, knowing what your contaminants are and having processes to deal with that. And also post-industrial versus post-consumer versus post-commercial materials. The quality is gonna be a little bit different. The quantities may be different. And then also your end markets are gonna be different for all of those. So you can see at the bottom, this is a, um, a bale of mixed film that's multicolored. So that's gonna go into a different route of, of being processed in something that would be clear commercial, for example. And then knowing your, knowing your markets, what are the demands for what you have and trying to find um, demand for the material that you've got in the quality that you have. So whether you clean it up to improve your quality or continue to provide what you're always collecting, the consistency of your material allows your buyer to continue to buy your material. So working on consistent grades, even if you're selling a grade C is better than having a grade A one week, maybe the next month having a grade B, having a grade C and back to an A, that's much harder to deal with because your in market doesn't necessarily know what they're getting from you. You know, can you sell direct versus having to go through a broker? You know, if you're able to store material and create a truckload or even a mixed truckload of material, you know, that's a route versus if you can only store a couple of bales or a couple of hundred pounds of material and having to have a, a hauler or a broker um, to consolidate your material for you. What are the specifications of your specific market? You know, there are general specifications that are gonna talk about overall quality and contamination and the amount of dirt or contaminants or strapping or non-resin material. But in, you know, the best specs to, to be aware of are those of the material buyers that are, you're actually selling to. And then what are the price influences? You know, what influences the price of material that are outside the control of the recycling stream? And to that, the end user is key. So knowing who you're selling to and, and working on that relationship with your specific end user is, um, is the key piece of knowing your market. So this is just kind of an overview of packaging. Um, you know, anybody that's been a grocery shopper for more than a couple of years has seen a real transition away from bottles and metal containers towards plastic wraps and now even into, you know, plastic pouches. And so you see it in um, 
medication, coffees, um, you know, and nuts, what we're seeing in shopping, we're moving away from even going to the store in the first place and things are coming in boxes to us, personal care items, single use um, materials, uh, baby foods are moving away from jars into squeezable pouches. And so as we see these transitions, we're going to see a transition in the uh, in what the MRFs are seeing. So the evolving ton is moving away from heavier materials and moving away from paper into multi-laminate plastics and single-use materials. And so what does the plastic film value chain look like? And this is not just for plastic film, but it's for all plastics. Um, the idea that you're going to collect, you know, haulers, retailers, institutions, uh, community programs, um, you know, where are you going to get this material and how are you going to get it from the business or from the household to the consolidation point? And so that happens at the MRF. It's happening at a broker warehouse. It's happening at distributors who might be backhauling or with the example of a retailer, um, they might be backhauling cardboard. They might be backhauling their plastic bags and film, both from con consumers at the front of the store and then also at the back of the store. If they're in deposit states, they may be also backhauling um, plastic bottles that are being collected and bailed as well. And then also scrap dealers. So not just within the plastic chain, but those who might be handling fiber or metals as well. So there's lots of opportunity to consolidate material. And for a lot of businesses and certainly for communities, having a consolidation point at a MRF or um, a local facility is the key to being able to get enough material that then makes it on to the next step, which is reclamation. Um, and this is how we get to flakes and pellets and the end products that are then made. And so this is where you get material that is washed, you get material that is separated. So for example, the bottles get turned into flakes and then the PET and the HDPE is separated and then the polypropylene lids go a different way and that material can then be further processed into pellets or flake as you see here. And then in markets, new bottles, uh, pipe, back sheeting, composite lumber. And then also this is where we start to see um, the brand companies where as consumers we can start to influence. So if we want to buy material, you know, a detergent that's made in a recycled content bottle or we're looking to buy garbage bags or ca can liners that are made from with recycled content, this is where we get to act as consumers to influence uh, the marketplace and, and actually be able to put our money where our mouths are, so to speak, um, to, to be able to influence the, the demand for recycled content. And so what are the market drivers? You know, what drives the plastics market? So obviously, um, for in the last 10 years, we had a major recession. Uh, in 2007, 2008, 2009, we're only really starting to come out of it in the last couple of years. And so general economic conditions, obviously when we have a recession, everything is recessed and all prices for all sorts of commodities, not just recycling commodities, uh, is depressed. Um, but then also the price of natural gas, petroleums and derivatives, the, the base um, components of plastics, that drives. When we see a high cost of oil and gas, Virgin plastics are expensive and it becomes easier for recycled content to be used because it's got a better price point because it's not being extracted and it's not being bought and traded and sold on the same market as the oil and commodities. But then also the virgin resin production capacity relative to demand. So we're seeing a lot of PET um, resin capacity come on board for, for virgin capacity across the, uh, across the globe meaning that there's a glut of virgin PET kind of irregardless of other materials and other price points and other influences. When you have a lot of material, uh, the demand for that does not keep up with supply and you see a drop in prices. And then that also um, influences industrial scrap and off-spec supplies. So as the price points come closer together, the cost of resin decreases and the cost of recycling and recycled content doesn't necessarily go down either. You start to see industrial scrap and off-spec supplies become um, less costly as well. And they fill in the place where perhaps the recycled content from post-consumer materials used to be. And so you see a lot of downward pressure on post-commercial and post-consumer materials. But really the key to what really drives at the local level is supply and demand for recycled feedstock. So what the markets are actually able to use. And a lot of that is tied back to the original point of the general economic conditions. In a recession, there's a lot less demand because there's just not as much output going on. But where you have high demand, some of these other um, points are mitigated. And so 
that leads us back to what I was saying as far as goals for recycled content. Are there policy changes that maybe are important to think about in the future? Are there uh, consumer education pieces of educating about the quality related to post-consumer resins? Are there um, information that we can provide to manufacturers to try to help um, match specs of material that they need to be able to make their, their components versus the material that's actually being created. And so what do we see currently? And you know, these are current economic conditions and have, this is basically what we've seen for the last year or so. We have a strong dollar. Um, we're seeing an excess of production for crude and other commodities. That's not changing primarily because of the low uh, price of material of um, crude oil, also changes in Asia and China. China specifically, there's the National Sword 2017, which a lot of people are calling Green Fence Part Two. Uh, it's very early, it's in very early stages, and so we haven't seen a lot of significant changes yet, although we do expect to see similar downturns in the lower grades of material moving forward, but we haven't uh, really been able to track that very much because it is such an early um, phase of the, of the event. And then also increased processing cost, light weighting of bottles, uh, lower bale yields. We're seeing that it takes more material to be able to get to the same amount of material being recycled by pounds. And so that means that we're seeing a down market for recycling in general, really tight margins. There's a lot of industry pains and constraints but that leads us to the point that the quality sells. Better quality material is the last thing to, 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 um, to struggle in a market. And so keeping your material clean, contaminant free, really allows you to continue to sell whatever resin that you've got. And so here is the latest data based on the 2015 analysis that we've just released showing um, domestic versus export. And so over the last six years or so, Exports of materials have been relatively flat, but we have seen a pretty significant increase in domestic processing of all commodities. And so that's a real positive. And as, as the US and Canadian um, economy continues to grow and thrive, we, I think we will continue to see this sort of growth. But I don't think that this is something that's sustainable in the long term without a lot more demand for material and more capacity to be able to use post-consumer and post-commercial resins in, in products. And so here is um, some historical scrap pricing. This is 2007 to early this year. And you can see, um, excuse me, um, that the blue line at the top, that is natural HDPE. Uh, colored HDPE is kind of a dark red that kind of sits in the middle. Um, the commercial film is a light orange line just under the blue line. And then um, the uh, mixed film is um, a blue line kind of at the bottom. Um, and so what you can see is that there's lots of different commodities and they tr seem to track pretty well with oil prices. And there are some spikes uh, unrelated to the oil prices that are maybe new players into the marketplace or a new processor coming online or a change in the processing capabilities or capacities of, of players. But then we start to see that, you know, things in general really um, kind of follow in general. And what you can see is from about late 2012 through 2014, you can really see the low quality materials really flattening out. That's curbside film, that's ag film, that's um, mixed bulky plastics. They really, that's when the green fence of 2013 really came into play in China. So we, uh, and a lot of those commodities really haven't rebounded. You know, they've, they've been really flat over time. And so we're kind of watching a lot of those lower grade commodities or mixed commodities to see how this national sword 2017 plays out as well. And so I'm going to move into, you know, an overview of specific commodities and some of the players related to um, these materials. So PET recycling, the recycling rate in uh, 2015 was uh, 30%. That's pretty flat over time. We we're somewhere in the low 30s and have been for the last several years. And that's an average of those deposit states where that rate is much, much higher and those states where there are no deposits and, and sometimes the the recycling rate in some states is very low in the single digits or, or low teens. Um, but we're also seeing that light, light weighting continues to affect yields, not quite as substantially as it did five years ago when we really saw a switch from uh, thicker walled bottles to thinner bottles. But we're still considering seeing um, 
a light weighting, but also we're seeing a, a decrease in bottle size in general. So as, as things become more concentrated or become refillable or the bottle is smaller, but then you buy um, the refill in a pouch or in a different kind of container, overall bottle size is getting smaller. And that's affecting bale yield. So we're in the mid 60s to mid 70%. So for every thousand pounds of PET material, you're seeing 60 to 70 percent of that, or 600 to 700 percent, 600 to 700 pounds of that is actual material that can be recycled. We're also seeing a flattening of bottle demand in general as we move away from bottles to other sorts of packaging, especially single-use things that may be in uh, tubes or pouches. You know, there's just less bottle demand in general. And we're seeing a lower PCR demand um, for PET, and that's related to virgin resin capacity. There's a lot more PET virgin material available at a lower price. And so you can see here, um, but we still have capacity in this graph to, to collect more material. So if we can recycle and collect more bottles, we have the capacity to, um, to be able to reclaim that and process, process that, and that is in the United States. So you can see we're off by probably about 20 to 30 percent of what we could actually um, process we are not actually collecting and so you know part of the other piece with PET is the thermoform challenge um, you know they're just different the difference between making a thermoform which is uses heat to make a rigid form versus a bottle which is blow molded and and they just have different properties and that makes it harder to recycle them together. It's not impossible, um, but that's part of also the bale yield is some of that thermoform material is, is just not usable for a lot of reasons. And that includes aggressive labels, being able to sort um, the clear plastic poly, um, polyolefins. So, you know, the difference, being able to tell the difference between a polypropylene and a polystyrene in a PET thermoform is very difficult. And um, also black plastic, a lot of the thermoforms have components to them that are black, which is also a challenge. And not all haulers, MRFs, or reclaimers want them. So if you're considering adding thermoforms into your recycling stream or are having difficulties with it, be sure that you're asking locally to see whether or not there's a way to be able to process this in your local community or um, at your local MRF or facility. And this is a, um, a chart that NAPCOR has put together that kind of shows how bottles move um, through the stream and, and what they're being made into. And so um, the blue line on the left is the bottles available. It's about um, nearly 6 million pounds, um, I mean, 6 million tons of material, excuse me. And then it kind of shows through, you know, how much is actually recycled. That is the kind of the purpley blue that's at the bottom. And then the disposal over here is the material that's not being actually captured and recycled. And so some of that is dirty, some of that is unavailable, but a lot of it is just not being recycled because facilities don't exist or perhaps it's happening away from home and the consumer doesn't have a recycling bin nearby. And so that's one of the challenges that we're seeing that we know we have capacity available for PET bottle recycling, but there's a lot of material that's being left. And then if you look underneath that black line on the right hand side, it shows fiber, sheet and film, strapping, food and beverage bottles, other non-food bottles, and then just other, it kind of shows how that material is being recycled and how it's being used. And just to say, I, I believe that Wayne mentioned this, but all of these slides will be available as well. So if you have specific questions about any of these, we can answer them at the end, but also these slides will be available for use. So moving on to HDPE bottles, the recycling rate here is slightly higher. We're at almost 35% in 2015. Again, we're seeing a right sizing of bottles, especially when it comes to detergents and shampoos and those kinds of household cleaners or beauty and um, healthcare products where you're seeing concentrated materials and you're not, the bottles are just not as big as they used to be. And so it takes a little bit more material uh, collected, a you know, number of pieces per bale has gone up. And so, um, but we're still feeling, seeing a bale yield at about 82% in 2015. And here we see end uses of, of PET bottle, I mean, of um, HDPE bottles. So you can see that non-food bottles and pipe uh, make up about 70% of the material and then the rest is made between film and sheet, lawn and garden, crates, buckets, automotive, and you can read the rest. Um, and again, we see a gap between collection and capacity in the United States. It's a little bit less than what we're seeing with PET, so there's still some growth opportunity for collecting material in the United States. So 
Moving on to non-bottle rigids, um, this is, uh, shows 2015 data, which I'd like to say is the latest data that we have available. We are just now starting the 2016 data analysis. We're sending out the survey um, now, and so that will report for 2016 will be ready at the end of the year in early 2018. So that's why 2015 data is the last that we have. Um, so you can see, Overall, we're seeing a growth in uh, polypropylene collection and also in other and mixed. Um, they have um, been kind of growing since 2007, especially the polypropylene. Uh, that's really been what's been driving the non bottle rigid growth over time. And so to speak more about polypropylene, um, the recycling rate is growing for both bottles and containers and caps. So one of the key bottles that you might see that's polypropylene is the large Arizona tea bottle, um, and, but then also yogurt containers, uh, margarine tubs, uh, things for sour cream. But there's also, uh, this is one place for some communities, if you're not already accepting this material, to expand collection because certainly the number five polypropylene material has in markets, it has demand. We do not have graphs on capacity or collection rates that we can share because there are so few players in this market at the moment, we can't. Uh, show that except in aggregate. And so the demand for material is continuing to grow as we saw on the last slide. And then, you know, the idea that um, PERFs, plastic recycling facilities, or secondary MERVs coming in to, to support the further growth of processing is one of the things that we're seeing where the material may be ones and twos, so the PET and the HDPE bottles are being pulled out at a MERF uh, locally, and then the rest of the materials are being consolidated and that may include one and two containers but it certainly is also including the number five containers as well you know the idea that those bales can be further sorted either at a specific perf that's just sorting plastics or secondary MRF that's also taking in other components maybe other aluminums beyond cans or other metal uh, scrap the idea that a secondary processing maybe makes it easier to capture this material. And so again, um, this is a source of non-bottle plastics. And so you can see here that polypropylene leads that at almost 40% in 2014. And so one of the resources that we do as um, the company at More Recycling is we help support data analysis and um, the resources available to show what's going on nationally. And this is a, um, a screenshot of a up close um, portion of the United States, this is the Southeast, um, showing what kind of facilities and what kind of programs exist for polypropylene. And the blue and red and um, green dots indicate whether they accept just bottles or if they can accept bottles and containers. And also it will let you know if it's a curbside collection versus drop off. And so this map is available at the URL seen here, but it's the idea that we're trying to provide more input and more information. We also have market information available for polypropylene as well. So if you're considering adding this to your mix or you're looking for a market for this material, we also have um, that information available. So one of the things I do want to talk about is you know, growing opportunities. And one of the big opportunities that we're seeing is the idea of being able to recycle polystyrene. And that's either food quality or food takeout containers, so you know, clamshells or that sort of thing that you might see coming out of a restaurant into go boxes, and also block material or what we call transportation polystyrene that's being um, shipped either as a cooler that maybe keeps things cold or as uh, protection for computers or televisions or electronics. There are domestic markets. Again, I, we don't have the ability to show capacity versus collection because there's so few players at the moment, but we do know that domestic markets exist. From what we've heard from a lot of those markets, they're not running at full capacity. They're somewhere between 70 and 80% for a lot of them. Densification is going to be essential because polystyrene is 90 to 95% air. And so being able to densify it into blocks, uh, which is shown here on this palette of material, or being able to kind of um, densify it and then extrude it, these are big, I call them kind of gobs. They kind of remind me of how a toothpaste tube squeezes out, you know, squeezes out toothpaste. They weigh about 15 or 20 pounds and they go in a super sack and they're being able to, um, being moved that way. It's easy, easily identifiable. Um, polystyrene uh, is typically white, uh, expanded polystyrene in particular is typically white, so it's really easy to pick out. We're not seeing that food contamination in general is problematic any more so than what we're seeing with other plastic packaging. Most consumers know pretty well um, when you're talking about 
relatively clean or rinsing or not throwing in things that has food scraps. We're seeing it with uh, some of the pro pilot programs with polystyrene with food packaging that in general, if it's really mucky and gross, people aren't throwing it in the recycling bin. And the Food Service Packaging Institute um, has a grant cycle. I believe the grant uh, application process just closed in April, but they're actually working with communities to, to be able to put balers either at MRFs or at collection centers to be able to expand collection of this material in communities. So if you have questions or in, in, need information about that, the Food Service Packaging Institute has information on their website. Uh, and again, we have another map and also case studies for foam polystyrene recycling. So this map shows um, whether or not it's uh, transportation packaging versus food packaging and whether it's collected curbside or at drop-off locations. And this is a, a map that we're continually trying to update to be able to show the best kind of access across the United States. But then also the case studies um, give some information about what's working and um, the manufacturers and the uh, end users that are using material, but also the communities that are actually able to capture this material. And that the URL for that material is at the top of this slide. So I'm gonna move on into film um, just a little bit here, and then I'm gonna talk about it a little bit more when I talk about the tools for collecting for quality. So over time, this is from 2007 to early this year, uh, obviously commercial film, it's typically clear, it's typically clean, a lot of times it doesn't have any kind of labels or issues with paper or any other um, dyes or printing on it, especially if it's a, a palette wrap. So it's obviously the highest quality and it really um, outpaces all of the other grades. But the mixed film that you're seeing at retailers, but also clean ag film, so the hoop house material that's not really touching the ground, both of those are also pretty strong in their, in their value as well over time. What we do see issues with with marketing and, and collection and processing is dirty egg film and especially curbside film. In the modern marketplace with things like the green fence and the um, continued efforts in China to keep what they consider trash material out, but also the low cost of virgin material, curbside film has really been squeezed out and we're really not seeing much of a market for curbside film. So I'm gonna talk a little bit more about some of the tools that help educate to keep curbside film out of the curbside and being able to use existing infrastructure at the return to retail or at drop off collection. So collecting for value, using clear terminology, both when you're educating residents and businesses about what material you want to accept or you can not accept, but also again, when you're trying to sell the commodities that you have, what is it that you actually have in your bale? Is it bottles and containers? Does that con con contain all plastics? Is it specific resins? But then also, the return to retail message for film and bags. So the plastic recycling terminology was created in 2013 and 14 with an industry kind of oversight and focus group to really lead us to better terminology with the expectation that better terminology about plastics leads to better recycling. And so better terminology leads to better communications with your residents, with communities, uh, with markets, and with the MRFs. And then that leads to more successful plastic recycling. So less confusion, more plastics collected, and in general, everyone gets exactly what they want. The consumer knows what they should put in, the MRFs collect the material that they want, the end markets get the material that they're actually seeking. And so the goal is to create, to increase the quality and quality quantity of plastics collected and to facilitate better tracking. So when we're calling things exactly what they are, when we're calling HDPE bottles that or we're talking about HDPE bottles and containers, it makes it easier for us to track data and to actually really see trends in the marketplace. And so we divided it up into two types of terms. One is outreach terms, which is meant for recycling programs to be able to educate to residents, <clears throat> excuse me. And so if you are in a region or a locality and you're calling the same thing by different names or one's using numbers and the other one's using descriptions, but they're not really clear you can really confuse your residents because someone may work in Springfield, for example, but live in Shelbyville. And so when you really try to consolidate and make the education materials that we use harmonious and comprehensive, then you're really able to educate the consumers in a way that's not confusing. But the other piece is commodity terms, where you streamline communications about buying and selling of the plastics that have been collected. So what are you selling? What's actually in the bale? And so what it, what's the challenge? People are confused and overwhelmed. When we have a long list of yes, 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 you know, recycle these sorts of materials, but then we have an equally long 
list of exclusions, <clears throat> sometimes it can be really overwhelming. And so this is an example that I pulled. This says plastics one through seven. It's a small image, but it has pre predominantly bottles with a big um, kind of carboid that you would use in a, uh, you know, a water fountain at a, maybe at a commercial uh, business. But in general, it's bottles. But then someone may say plastics one through seven, can I recycle everything plastic? Does that really mean an egg carton or a bag that might have a number on it? Um, and so, you know, these are some examples of materials that may have numbers on them, but they're not really bottles, but they are plastics. And so, you know, maybe they then say, I don't get it, so forget it, or I'm not sure, but I'll put it in anyway because it has a number on it. So using meaningful terms um, that effectively communicate can really help clear up some of that uh, confusion. And so how this works is for the outreach terms, it's four easy steps to build your program with images. And then if you want, there's even a tool that will help you build a program flyer. So you kind of go through and you pick the materials that you want to accept any additional materials that maybe are a little bit of a niche. For example, you might want five gallon buckets and then any notes about how to handle that material um, and then any exclusions that you have. And so the materials are defined here so that they're um, for easy usage. So basically, you know, what's a, five, what's a bucket versus toys versus plastic uh, bulky items and, you know, food and household bottles and jars. And so all of that material is laid out uh, for use. And then you can create a flyer that has, for example, please recycle plastic containers. Additionally, you would like buckets, by the way, empty, flatten, and put caps back on, or rinse and wipe out and you know, remove as much residue as you can. And then exclusions would be no containers that help hazardous products, no bags, wraps, or film plastic, and no foam. And then you can add a logo or your contact information at the end, and you can use this as a flyer to help support your education. Additionally, if you don't want to build a flyer, but you want to be able to incorporate your plastics uh, terminology into your ex existing educational material, you can also use a royalty-free image gallery. So you can download um, specific images, but we also have um, groupings of materials. And so moving on to the commodity terms, you know, this is how you communicate with the MRFs in the markets. So what's the municipality asking? You know, what are we diverting? How much material are we getting? What kind of material is it? So they're going to ask the MRF, you know, what's coming out of, of our stream? And so the MRF can be able to, it will be able to state what's exactly in those bales. But then the MRF is going to be able to communicate with the market, you know, what's, what's being bought and sold. So the market says, what am I buying? And the MRF is able to say, this is what's in my bale. So um, the better communication means better tracking, more understanding and more value of actually what's in the marketplace. And so, you know, we asked um, Susan Robinson from Waste Management to give us a quote about why using commodity terms, because it's really important to them in the, in the role that they play as a collector and also in some ways a consolidator broker, is that they recognize the importance of communicating with one voice to communities and the residents about what to put in the bin, but also with markets about what's being sold. Common terminology helps us achieve that goal. So I think that that really sums it up in a nutshell, that it moves from uh, the household all the way up into the marketplace. And so one of the things that we really want to talk about, you know, as far as using common terminology is consistent data, because when we're talking about the same thing across the United States, we're really able to really track that data. And so Retract Connect has incorporated our um, commodity terms and our outreach terms into their tracking for um, states and local programs. The EPA has adopted this for their state data management program, and APR is using this. Um, we've tried to make our terms fit with their bail uh, specifications as well. So as you're seeing these things, um, this, these terms across the board, it makes it easier for us to be able to track data. So for example, we're using availability of recycling data. Um, this is what the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission uses to be able to say whether or not a material is considered recyclable. And so these dots allow us to pinpoint um, the communities across the United States that have recycling availability for polypropylene tubs and containers. So green means yes, red means no. But when a community calls them tubs and containers and they reference polypropylene, we know exactly what they're accepting. But also it allows us to do bail audits and MRF studies of what's actually being collected and what's actually being sold in the marketplace. And then the last piece of that is recycling reports. This is how we get our data, you know, by being able to call it exactly what it is and not just lumping it all together as plastic or just bottles and then other. 
you know, we're really able to tease out the kind of materials that are being collected. But this is also really important to markets and end users. If they know that there's a lot of material in a certain place, um, you know, and they're looking to build a new plant or they're looking for new infrastructure improvements, you know, knowing the material that's actually being collected and where it's coming from and the sources allows them to really pinpoint where they have the opportunity to get close to their sources of material. And so this is how you would find uh, the terms and tools. The um, outreach terms are recycleyourplastics.org slash terms and tools. The commodity terms are recycleyourplastics.org slash commodity terms. Again, these slides will be available at the end. And so I want to segue now into bags and film, which I think is the other key piece of, of quality. And it's a, it's a little bit of a different um, problem because it's not that this material is not recyclable. It is just uh, problematic in the curbside stream. And so what we want to talk about is a return to retail message. And it doesn't have to be just return to retail in the sense that it only can go to a grocery store. <clears throat> it can also go to any kind of participating drop off where the material is kept segregated and kept clean and dry. And so the real piece is this, is that we want to discourage curbside collection. And as you can see on the graph on the right, the cost at the MRF, that's the red um, kind of negative, is so much more than even the cost and the you know the benefit that a, that a retailer is seeing and so if we're able to shift the vast majority of this material to the retail or to the existing drop-off infrastructure we'll really be able to improve recycling at the MRF level in both the amount of material being collected and sorted but also in the decrease of downtime and the manpower required to deal with plastic film and bags so there are more than 18,000 drop-off locations in the United States there's about another thousand in Canada um, there's many opportunities to improve commercial collection, so that's one of the pieces that we're really working on is how do we improve access to material uh, recycling for small and mid-sized businesses that don't have enough material to really consolidate and hold and collect um, themselves to be able to sell directly, but they rely on a hauler or a broker to be able to collect that material. And then the last piece is the growing use of the How to Recycle label, which is seen um, this is on a package that I saw during a bag audit that uh, it's it was a package around Propel, which is a, a bottle um, bottle of uh, electrolyte material of water. Um, and so there are different images here. One of them is for the overwrap, one of them is for the bottle, and one of them is for the cardboard that's in the bottom of the case. So we've seen this again. Um, you know, this is I just wanted to reiterate the commercial film, the mixed retail, and the ag film. Keeping the material clean really keeps the value. If you look at the bottom, the curbside film is the green line at the bottom, and it has really been flat for about a year and a half. Um, and so we don't really have any expectations that curbside film recycling is really going to improve uh, with in the near term. So that's part of the reason that we really want to push the uh, return to retail message. And so you can see the difference in pricing for these materials. So just to kind of reiterate that, you know, retail collection and again, drop off collection more broadly keeps material clean, dry and valuable for in markets. It takes advantage of the existing infrastructure. And so at the retailer, they're collecting this material at the front end and they're consolidating it with the material at the back end. And for those large retailers that are already running their distribution networks, they're taking this back to their distribution uh, centers, consolidating it, and they're really not using any resources because the trucks are going back to those distribution centers anyway. And so they're really piggybacking on an empty load, so to speak, to take back materials that can be reclaimed and recycled. Um, so the one con is that for, con for the consumer, they have to take the material elsewhere. It is easier to put in the trash or the bin but if you really want to be able to recycle this material and recycle it well, taking it back to the retailer is the key piece here. Um, so for curbside, you know, the one pro is that it's easy for consumers. It's, you just put it in with everything else. But the cons are really significant. It's problematic for MRFs. It reduces efficiency for all commodities. And it's generally too dirty for domestic processing. It's very expensive to clean. And with the shutdown of uh, China as well, again, with National Sword 2017, we're probably not really gonna see any export movement either. And so the final analysis for curbside is no markets currently to justify the extra cost of washing or handling it to recycle this material, which you know just really reiterates the idea that retail collection is really a key piece. And so one of the things that we've done is the RAP program has really worked to put together commodity um, collateral, excuse me, 
to be able to really emphasize that message that says, you know, recycle your bags and wraps here, not in curbside recycling. This would be suitable. This is a poster that would be suitable to put on a drop-off bin or, or for a retailer to use, but also to just educate in general about the material beyond bags that should also not go in the curbside bin that, is, that are really, really recyclable. Uh, for example, bread bags, case wraps, bubble wraps, uh, the air pillows that you're finding in um, shipments from online retailers uh, to take them you know, to a specific place, but not in the curbside recycling. And so, like I said, we have over 18,000 drop-off locations in the United States, about another thousand in Canada. And that number is always growing because the retailers are seeing value from this material. It is a revenue generator for them, but it also means that uh, consumers are coming in the door. If you know that you want to recycle this material and there's a grocery store around the corner that has a recycling bin, you know, already being there means that the consumer might actually run in and grab something while they're there. Uh, we also know from data that we've collected at some research campaigns um, about recycling salmon bags at grocery stores that the consumer really believes that this is an important and valuable um, program that the, that the retailer runs. And so we have a lot of positive feedback from consumers that really like these programs as well. And so what can we do? Um, the Wrap Recycling Action Program was started in 2013 to really try to bring together uh, a partnership of, of industry, retailers, communities to really find solutions for films and bags that are not reliant on curbside bins and the MRFs for collection. We want to maximize material quality for film and the other commodities. So keeping the film out means that the, the MRF doesn't have to shut down as much. It makes it easier to sort material. Things aren't getting caught in the machinery. Um, it protects the local environment, you know, litter from bags and film can be quite problematic in, in places. And so providing an alternative for this and a, a way to collect it can help with litter abatement. And it also supports just sustainability goals by diverting material from the landfill. And so what is RAP? It's um, a free and voluntary public outreach um, initiative and it's led by the Flexible Film Recycling Group. It seeks to engage motivated partners nationwide, whether you are a community, a hauler, a MRF, a retailer, uh, and um, a local organization that deals with sustainability, a KEB affiliate. Um, if you are really interested in this program and wanting to keep film and bag material out of both the trash but also out of the curbside bin, um, there's a place for you within the WRAP program. We're really trying to double film recycling by 2020. Uh, that's from 2011 rates, which was 1 billion pounds. We're trying to get to 2 billion pounds, 2 billion pounds by 2020. And our objective is to really dramatically increase film recycling by forging partnerships with allies and stakeholders, providing educational tools and programs, but also gathering data to improve those tools and to provide more information to, to users and stakeholders. Oh, excuse me. Um, I need to go back one. So these are some of the tools that we have. We have case studies uh, to kind of highlight what's going on at malls and retail centers. We have tip sheets to support your collection goals. We have a drop-off directory for the uh, recyclers in uh, drop off and the retailers are, are accepting this material. We also have a film di recycler directory. So haulers and markets that are accepting this material and buying. We have cart tags, we have digital badges, we have information cards. So all of this is found at plasticfilmrecycling.org. And so I'm gonna wrap this up by going through some overall plastic, film, uh, plastic market uh, resources, um, both film and rigid. So, um, one of the key pieces is putting the pieces together on um, collection in general. So, you know, having demand for PCR use and not just PCR as far as post-consumer, but also post-commercial and to a certain degree, post-industrial resins, making sure that we have the demand that pulls this material through the recycling stream. Design guidelines that are not only usable, but they're also being followed. So knowing the materials that can be recycled and following the guidelines uh, as a brand manufacturer is creating new packaging you know, that that material actually has a home within a recycling stream or within a, a you know, a drop-off collection sort of thing. You know, policy and infrastructure, what pieces of that drive um, the ability to be able to recycle plastics? Curbside collection, you know, where certain materials that are really readily available and readily recyclable and have ready markets, you know, pulling those in the curbside bin versus keeping things for special drop-offs or special collection like polystyrene and bags and film, but then also commercial access, because that's where a lot of this material is available, but especially in small and mid-sized businesses, uh, you know, the ability to collect that material and sort it and hold it and process it uh, is one of the things that's missing. So how does this all come together? 
uh, bail specifications, you know, what should be in a particular bail that you're trying to sell. You know, ISRI has these, APR has these, um, and those are going to be found on both of those websites. But then also individual buyers are going to have specific specifications that they want based on the grades that they buy and that they're able to use. And so we're working in general with an industry to streamline grades, types, and language, and that circles us back to the plastic terms and tools and being able to really consolidate and make comprehensive bail specifications to give um, general overview of what kind of materials and what can and can't be put in a bail. But knowing what your specific buyer wants is probably the most important spec that you're going to have. And so making sure that you're keeping that line of communication open is really key. Um, some of the directories that we help manage are um, the film recycler directory, the plastic recycling directory. That's going to be for all sorts of plastic, not just film, and then also recycled film products directory. So if you're looking for recycled content, this is a directory that we have currently for recycled film material, but we're hoping to advance that, um, uh, expand that to make uh, other rigid plastic materials as well. Um, and some of the tools that within industry, uh, like I said, we've got tip sheets and uh, support for different pieces of the puzzle. For example, this one says warehousing and distribution, how can you collect material? But then also APR has um, some non-bottle um, toolkits. One of them is for containers. One of them is about keeping your caps on. And then also KEB has information about plastic bottles and containers and how you can uh, recycle that material. This is from their I want to be recycled page. And then one of the pieces that we're you know, finishing up right now is a value chain case study to show how pieces of the puzzle within the plastic value chain move together. Currently, it's solely for film, but we're looking to expand that um, in the coming months and years. So the idea of you know, how do you start with consolidation and how do you start with education and collection, moving through reclamation and then end use. And so it's going to have resources for all parts of the value chain case studies, reports, tools, and then it's also going to highlight recycling successes. So that's going to be something that we're planning on releasing hopefully by the end of May. Um, plasticsmarkets.org is a website that we run uh, that is a uh, database of buyers and sellers of materials. So you can list in the directory if you are a buyer. You can also search for a buyer if you're looking for a market for specific material. It shows scrap pricing, which is the graph at the bottom export procedures. It also has links to the recycling reports and the image on the right hand of the screen basically shows how you can search for specific materials, whether you have a truckload or less than truckload, whether you're looking for a buyer or supplier, how the material is, is, being, is being held, is it bailed, is it loose, is it densified, and then at the bottom, you know, commodity types uh, that you can search for specifically. And then some final links to the bail specs for ISRI and APR, and then also the links for those websites that I had just mentioned, Plastics Markets, Plastic Film Recycling, and also RecycleYourPlastics.com. And that's it. Um, and I'm done. And so, Wayne, I'll turn it over to you for questions. All right. Thank you, Tanya. Great presentation. And by the way, the presentation has been uh, loaded onto our handouts section so on your control panel you can you can download that, that for the presentation in, in pdf format so we have some questions but uh, if you do have a question uh, please use to go to webinar dialog box on your control panel so uh we'll get right to it here uh going back to one of the beginning slides mm -hmm. tanya could you explain the uh the term aggressive label Aggressive labels. So that's going to be a label. What we see specifically with thermoforms in particular is a label that has a really aggressive adhesive, meaning it does not come off easily and it doesn't come off easily even in the wash process. And so we have seen those in particular with thermoforms, uh, less so with bottles because a lot of that has been moved away from uh, through some work with APR, but that's what that means. It's a label that just won't come off. Okay. How does the different collection systems, single stream, dual stream, or source separate affect the value and quality of the plastic marketability? Um, so in general, the more separated a material is, the higher the value because it is more predominantly the resin that you're looking for. So for example, a PET bottle bale, um, if it's if it's source separated and you know you have the ability to control what's coming into the bin, say at a collection center and it's or at a deposit center if you're in a deposit state, pretty much what we see in that bale is 
90 to 100 percent PET bottles. You may see a couple of thermoforms put in. And the more you move away from source separated, you have more opportunity for other things to be mixed in. And so if, for anyone who's never been to a MRF, the material is going by really quickly. There's lots of different materials in there. And so, for example, out of a MRF stream, you may see that the PET bottle bale has a lot more thermoforms in it because you're seeing a lot more thermoforms, but you're also going to see bits of paper or you might see bits of cardboard or you might see um, shredded paper that's been intermingled just because of the way that it's being processed. And so that bale yield that we're seeing that I mentioned at 60 to 70 percent for PET bottle bales are predominantly from um, single stream materials. So obviously as you get to dual stream or source separated where the bottles are kept separate, the yields go up. Just how significant is the Chinese green fence when you consider that the majority of plastic used and then recycled in China is domestically generated at a level approaching 90%? Does China really create that large an influence on plastic markets other than those markets who are sending the junk materials to overseas markets? Um, so I think that's a really good question. And I, I think that the answer is kind of in that question as well. The higher quality materials especially on the East Coast and in the Midwest, are staying domestically. Um, and so they're not really dependent on China, but certainly lower quality materials that don't have domestic capacity for recycling them are much more dependent on exports. And so that is where China plays a key role because they are one of the biggest, uh, even though they're 90% of the material may, maybe is domestically generated, China as a country is so large and such a large player in the global marketplace, even the 10% that they're getting from other places does have a ripple effect uh, on specific markets that are de dependent primarily on exporting the material out of the United States. The graph of historic scrap prices shows the current price of commercial film at 20 cents a pound. I've been asking around and 12 cents a pound is the best price uh, that she's heard. Uh, what could be, what could account for this difference? A lot of it is, you know, this is a, this is a kind of a general question, and so I mean a general graph, and so it could be that this has the prices have dropped a little bit, um, but it also depends a little bit on whether or not the material is delivered or picked up. Uh, this is delivery price, and so the idea that if they have to provide transportation, that sometimes knocks down um, pricing a little bit. Distance obviously plays a part in where you are compared to a local buyer. Also, um, specific quality. So not all commercial film is exactly the same. We have uh, one end user has about 26 grades. And so, um, you know, an A plus versus a D grade, while they might be still commercial film and they might be really, really great compared to what you might see coming out of a grocery store, that might be the difference of a couple of cents. All right, here's one. In general, I find PVC and or, and or polystyrene are essentially unrecyclable, even as a mixed rigid plastic. How do recyclers and MRFs deal with these two plastic categories when they're so difficult to recycle? Um, so it is, I would say PVC in general is, is a really difficult commodity. And it's, it's in some ways because um, recycling it is difficult. There's other intrinsic issues related to the recyclability of that that are related to what it's made out of. Polystyrene is a little bit different um, and its difficulties come a lot from the fact that it's expanded. Expanded polystyrene is very lightweight, very similar to bags in that sense. And so if you were to try to fill up a tractor trailer with undensified material, you would only get a couple thousand pounds at best. And so um, part of the challenge with that is being able to densify it and collect it in a way that allows you to um, capture it, hold it, and also store it. And so, that once you, if you can, if you can densify it and hold it, the recyclability of it improves considerably because there are markets and there are domestic markets that are able to process it. Because the beautiful thing about polystyrene, expanded polystyrene, is because it's basically been whipped to be expanded. It doesn't have any colorants in it. It doesn't have Inks. It typically doesn't have labels on it, and so getting back a, a, a pristine form that can be reused is pretty easy in that regard. 
So um, if anybody has a specific follow-up to that, I'd be glad to answer it. And then, Wayne, I did see that you sent a, a question to me earlier about how much does that pallet weigh. That pallet of polystyrene probably weighs four to 500 pounds. Oh. Those, those blocks are pretty significant. They are pretty much the weight of a, like a cinder block by the time they get to that form. So you can get the pretty, pretty good weight with a, a truckload. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I don't think, I think 40,000 pounds is, is kind of hard, but I think 25 to 30,000 pounds is pretty doable on a truckload. Yep. And here's another related question. It sounds like there's a little bit of frustration in this. Do most residents know what the expression of no foam means? <laughs> so. um, I would say, I would say um, probably not kind of, kind of tongue in cheek. I feel like a lot of times, um, People and I and I myself included because I'm a recycler and I'm a resident and I try to do my best, do the best with what they're given. And so sometimes um, the there's mixed messages. And so that kind of goes back to the terminology piece. If if you say all plastics one through seven, but then they find a piece of foam that has a number on it, the confusion comes from well this has a number, but they say no foam. And so sometimes they think oh they must want it because it has a number on it. So I'm going to put it in, even though the exclusion says no foam. And so, you know, I was just at an Earth Day event uh, two weeks ago. And a lot of people said, well, it has a number on it. That means it's recyclable, right? And so, you know, there's, there's a definite, I think, miseducation of consumers that the resin identification code implies recyclability when in fact, all it does is tell us what resin it is. And so just because it has a number doesn't necessarily mean that it's recyclable. So in a nutshell, no, I do not think that all residents or even most residents know that no foam means no foam. Yeah, sticking to the, the foam theme, how do you densify polystyrene? What's the, what's the equipment used? Um, so there are a couple, there are, there are different levels. One of them is a cold press and then one of them is a heat press. But the idea is basically that you take a bunch of polystyrene, typically not packing peanuts, but it's going to be block or the, um, the takeout containers. And they go in, they can either be shredded or ground, or they go in solid. And basically it just uses a big press, either with heat or just pressure. And it presses out all the air and then it comes out in a block or as that kind of toothpaste tube squeezed sort of thing, it kind of gets extruded that way. So um, there is there is information on some of those case studies about um, the different materials, but if you have specific questions about densifiers, you can certainly reach out to me as well at the email or on my number that's on the screen. Let's see. Uh, does the growing popularity of city and our statewide, uh, such as California, bans on plastic carryout bags and mixed messages about collecting film plastic? Of course, we have an abundance of plastic film on our products, dry cleaning sleeves, shrink wrap, plastic covering, paper towels, et cetera. But the retail stores, especially in the ban states. Um, so what we're seeing is in some ways um, without enforcement, the California ban and, and the California legislation up before, even before the ban required retailers to um, have collection bins, even if they weren't giving out the bags. But without enforcement, what we're starting to see is some retailers pulling those bins with the kind of the expression of, well, we're not giving out bags anymore. We don't have to collect this material. And so there is definitely uh, a little bit of, of work that needs to be done in California to, to make sure that the access to being able to recycle the other materials that are still available and are still there and I think are growing, like the, the person uh, said in the question, to make sure that we continue to have that access, access because without retail access, um, there really begins to see a diminished ability for consumers to be able to recycle this because it's not being accepted curbside. And it really shouldn't be at this point because the material can't be kept clean and dry. Do retailers get paid for collecting plastic bags? Yes. Uh, they don't get paid specifically because they're collecting plastic bags, but when they consolidate this material, at their uh, distribution center and they are making truckloads of this material they're getting paid by the for the material when it's sold to, when it's sold to end markets all right i think we're running out of time here so i think we're gonna we're gonna wrap it up so again uh, this webinar like all the webinars in this series has been recorded 
and will be made available via YouTube links on both the National Recycling Coalition and Recycling Market Center websites. Thank you again for joining us. We hope you'll join us for next month's webinar and please visit the National Recycling Coalition and Recycling Market Center websites for schedule updates. And thank you again, Tanya, for the great presentation. And um, hopefully everybody will get a chance to download the, uh, the, the slides. Okay, so everybody have a great day and, uh, and thanks again, Tanya. All right, thanks, Wayne.